As 2025 winds down, SpaceX has certainly pulled off some incredible achievements. But, like any ambitious year, it hasn't been without its bumps. Today, let's take a look at what SpaceX's COO had to say about this year's launch targets, whether they hit them, and what the company has planned for the future. But first, huge congratulations to the powerful women of SpaceX. Gwyn Shotwell has landed at number 20 on Forbes' list of the world's most powerful women of 2025, and it's well-deserved. Forbes says the list focuses on powering massive change using four key metrics, money, media, impact, and spheres of influence. Depending on the role, that means everything from GDP and population size for political leaders to revenue, valuations, and employee counts for corporate executives, along with media presence and social reach across the board. As Forbes put it, in industry, women manage the infrastructure governments rely on but cannot run themselves. SpaceX's Gwyn Shotwell keeps the systems behind defense and global connectivity functioning. She's ranked just ahead of Taylor Swift at number 21, who reportedly spent $300 million to regain ownership of the master recordings for her first six albums. Power looks different in every industry, but it's great to see it recognized so clearly. For anyone who doesn't know who Gwyn Shotwell is, she's the SpaceX powerhouse. As president and COO of SpaceX, Shotwell runs the company's day-to-day -day operations and manages customer and strategic relationships that drive SpaceX's growth. She joined the company way back in 2002 as vice president of business development and went on to build the Falcon launch manifest to more than 70 launches, representing over $10 billion in business. She also serves on SpaceX's board of directors. Before SpaceX, Shotwell spent more than a decade at the Aerospace Corporation, working across space systems engineering, technology, and project management. She became chief engineer for an MLV-class satellite program, led a landmark FAA study on commercial space transportation, and conducted major space policy analysis to guide NASA's future investments. She was later recruited as director of Microcosm's Space Systems Division, where she sat on the executive committee and led corporate business development. Her influence extends beyond industry, too. In 2014, Shotwell was appointed to the U.S. Export-Import Bank's Advisory Committee and the FAA's Management Advisory Council. Over the years, she's earned the World Technology Award for Individual Achievement in Space, been inducted into the Women in Technology International Hall of Fame, and named a Fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And if Elon Musk sometimes paints an ambitious, let's say optimistic, timeline, Shotwell is often the one who brings things back to reality, offering a clearer picture of where programs like Falcon 9, Starlink, and even Starship actually stand. That balance is a big part of what makes her so impactful. Recently, Gwyn Shotwell posted that, we hit our target, we changed it mid-year, and still aren't done yet. Congrats to all that work on the GOAT rocket program. The target she was referring to was 165 launches this year. Late last year, Shotwell had said SpaceX was aiming for 175 to 180 Falcon 9 launches in 2025. Even though they didn't hit that original goal, SpaceX VP of launch Kiko Donchev explained that the company revised the manifest to 165 launches over the summer based on business and operational needs and they're still not quite finished. There are two more Falcon launches left in 2025, which would bring the total to 167 for a little extra credit. Donchev also noted that SL6-99 to marked the last single-stick launch from LC-39A for a while, as SpaceX shifts focus toward Falcon Heavy missions and ramps up Starship launches from the Cape. Honestly, that's still an incredibly impressive number. It absolutely blows past SpaceX's previous single-year record of 134 orbital launches, which was only set last year. I still find it amazing how this launch cadence has become almost normal. Just five years ago, in 2020, SpaceX flew around 25 missions, already a healthy pace at about two launches a month. Now they're launching, on average, every two to three days. That kind of jump really highlights how Falcon's reusability and reliability, combined with the hard work and dedication of the SpaceX team, have been critical to maintaining assured access to space. And to put it in perspective, SpaceX now has a second stage rolling off the production line every two and a half days. 
Of course, we can't forget the program that isn't just the future of SpaceX, but could genuinely reshape the future of spaceflight as a whole. Starship. What was once a bold concept has clearly moved into a very real, very active test phase. Between the test flights that kicked off in early 2025 and Elon Musk's typically ambitious statements, it's obvious that SpaceX is pushing hard toward fully reusable orbital launches and, eventually, that long-awaited mission to Mars. 2024 was the year SpaceX got serious about getting Starship testing underway. With four test flights, a successful landing, and multiple successful splashdowns, I think it's safe to say they succeeded there. For 2025, SpaceX's goal is to get Starship as close to operational as they can. Throughout 2025, SpaceX flew Starship five times as part of its integrated flight test campaign, using the Super Heavy booster paired with the Starship upper stage. These missions marked both the debut and the retirement of the Block 2, version 2, design. The year built on earlier successes like booster catches, but it also exposed growing pains with the redesigned upper stage. The first half of the year was particularly rough, with three consecutive upper stage failures that slowed momentum and raised questions about Block 2's maturity. The year began on January 16th with Flight 7, the first Block 2 launch. The Super Heavy booster was successfully caught by the launch tower's chopsticks, an incredible milestone. But the upper stage was lost during ascent due to engine issues and vibrations. A similar story played out on March 6th during Flight 8, when the booster was again caught successfully, but the ship broke up near the end of its burn, with debris later observed over the Caribbean. On May 27th, Flight 9 introduced another milestone with the first reflight of a Super Heavy booster. The upper stage reached space, but lost control during its coast phase and was ultimately lost. Things finally turned around in the second half of the year. After a June ground explosion involving Ship 36 delayed progress, Flight 10 lifted off on August 26 and marked a major recovery. The booster splashed down successfully, while the upper stage completed its trajectory, deployed mock Starlink satellites, relit its engines in space, survived re-entry with heat shield testing, and made a controlled splashdown in the Indian Ocean. That momentum carried into October 13th with Flight 11, the final Block 2 mission and the last launch from the original Pad A configuration at Starbase. A reflown booster performed another soft splashdown, and the upper stage completed satellite deployment, tested advanced re-entry maneuvers, including flying with missing heat shield tiles, and executed a controlled splashdown. That flight was widely considered a success and provided critical data for future catch attempts. By the end of the year, SpaceX had clearly demonstrated booster reuse and repeated tower catches, even though upper stage catches were not attempted in 2025. Attention gradually shifted toward version 3 development, despite a testing anomaly involving booster 18 in November. On the infrastructure side, SpaceX also reached an important milestone in December with environmental approval for Starship launches from Florida's SLC-37. Originally, SpaceX had hoped to fly Starship as many as 25 times in 2025, but only five launches ultimately happened due to technical challenges and regulatory timelines. Still, the year ended on a high note. The road was anything but smooth, but the lessons learned set the stage for the next chapter. For now, there are no Starship launches planned for the remainder of the year as the program transitions fully to the upgraded version 3 hardware. If Starship really does crack full reusability, it opens the door to an entirely new set of possibilities. Take Starlink, for example. Once Starship is fully operational and starts launching full-size Starlink satellites, SpaceX is expected to shift most, if not all, Starlink missions over to Starship. Does that mean Falcon launches are living on borrowed time? Maybe but that's just how progress works. When something dramatically better comes along, the second best option is eventually phased out. The implications go far beyond Starlink. For a Mars mission, a fully reusable rocket could slash costs and make regular supply and return missions possible, rather than relying on one-off probes or flags and footprints missions. As ambitious as it sounds, Musk has long talked about Mars colonization as a way to make humanity multi-planetary, and Starship is clearly designed with that goal in mind. Beyond Mars, Starship's massive payload capacity could reshape access to space altogether, whether that's deploying large satellite constellations, supporting lunar missions like Artemis III, or enabling entirely new types of missions we haven't seriously considered before. 
Of course, there are still big hurdles ahead. On-orbit refueling at this scale hasn't been proven yet, and rapid turnaround, along with full heat shield reuse, remains largely theoretical for now. Time will tell whether Starship can truly deliver on its promise, but if it does, the impact on spaceflight will be hard to overstate. To wrap things up, here's a pretty wild piece of SpaceX news, and it involves Starlink's much quieter, more secretive cousin, Starshield. NASA is planning to test SpaceX's Starshield satellite network to help support operations of the Deep Space Network, DSN, the global system of antennas that keeps spacecraft connected as they explore the solar system. In a December 11th procurement filing, NASA revealed its intent to award a sole source contract to SpaceX for Starshield terminals and data services. The agency didn't disclose the contract's value, but the scope alone makes it clear this is more than a casual experiment. Under the plan, NASA would install seven Starshield terminals across its three DSN sites in Australia, California, and Spain. Along with that, the agency would receive eight data subscriptions, each capable of handling five terabytes of data per month, all using what NASA describes as a continuous, government-only, encrypted data service. In short, fast, secure, and built to government standards. This would be a six-month pilot program run by NASA's Space Communications and Navigation Program, or SCAN, with the goal of adding redundancy between DSN sites. Rather than relying solely on terrestrial fiber connections, Starshield would provide a secure space-based backup. According to NASA, the idea is to boost resiliency and flexibility, especially as demand on the DSN continues to grow. Starshield itself is an offshoot of Starlink aimed mainly at national security customers, offering communications, imaging, and other services. SpaceX doesn't say much publicly about the network, how many satellites it has, or what they can do, but it does emphasize security. The company notes that while Starlink already provides end-to-end -end encryption, Starshield adds higher assurance cryptography designed to handle classified payloads and meet strict government requirements. That focus on security seems to be a major reason NASA is interested. The pilot program specifically calls for strong encryption standards, including AES-128 or better, along with protections for sensitive and export-controlled data. What makes this especially interesting is that NASA hasn't previously talked about using Starshield for DSN operations at all. Most recent discussions around the DSN have focused on how to manage increasing demand and how vulnerable the network can be when something goes wrong like the damage that sidelined one of its massive 70-meter antennas in California earlier this year. At the same time, NASA is also working with SpaceX and other companies on a separate effort to use commercial systems to support communications for spacecraft in Earth orbit. In that case, SpaceX is demonstrating an optical relay network using regular Starlink satellites, not Starshield. So this Starshield pilot stands out as something new, and potentially a big deal. If the test goes well, it could mark the first step toward weaving SpaceX's most secure satellite network directly into the backbone of NASA's deep space communications. Not bad for a program that usually stays out of the spotlight.